Hi, this is uh, Nicolas uh, Alexiou uh, from the Hellenic American Project Hub, uh, Queen's College CUNY, and the Oral History Archives. Uh, today we have an interview uh, with uh, Johnny Yanni Futialis, uh, September 6, 2021. Uh, Yanni, thank you very much for uh, you know, accepting our invitation. It's very important to uh, you know, record and document uh, your fascinating uh, experience in the United States, the family well, and yours. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and it's a real honor to be part of the uh, project. Okay. Uh, let's start uh, saying a few things about where you were born, where the family came from, who immigrated first, uh, some background of, of, of the family. Sure. Well, I was born in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey in 1963. Uh, so I've been here a while and uh, I've lived uh, in the United States my whole life. My mother and father uh, emigrated to the United States in 1956 uh, at the same time because they came here together. They were married in Greece the same year and uh, it came to the US. My father, was born in uh, the city of Costanza in Romania, and my mother was born in Athens, and they met in Greece in the early uh, 1950s, uh, married and, and came here. And the roots of the family, because the name has um, a very uh, uh, long history, I realized, uh, where, where the, the family's background? Uh, well, beyond, uh, beyond your family. Yeah, I, I don't know um, beyond my grandparents or great grandparents. Uh, I'm not really sure on my father's side. My father has some theories. Uh, and the reason I'm not sure is because there aren't really any records. It's clear that my, both my grandparents from my father's side, they were born in uh, Anatoliki Thraki, uh, in Thrace, mm -hmm. uh, uh, during and in the Ottoman Empire. My uh, grandfather on my father's side was born in Gallipoli, which is a, a quite famous city on the Dardanelles. And my grandmother was born a, near uh, Adrianupoli or in Edirne as it's known. And um, they both uh, emigrated to Romania, to Costanza, probably in the very early years of the 20th century uh, really just to, to find uh, a life there because there was a very, very big uh, Greek uh, community in Costanza. So big that my father tells me that uh, there was a cathedral there. Uh, there were a number of Greek schools, uh, newspapers. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a very uh, firmly established Greek community. So my grandparents actually met there, married there, and my father was born there in 1925. This is uh, very interesting to hear because uh, it reminds us, you know, the, the, the background of Hellenism and the, the diaspora. And of course, uh, this region that you mentioned, the Romania and the other Balkan uh, uh, countries and areas, yeah. a significant contribution to the Greek revolution and to many other sure. things. Uh, yeah. so, this is very easy to, to, to realize the diasporic nature of, of, uh, of, of Greece. Uh, and and um, in, in the mid 50s, uh, they immigrated here uh, to the States. Uh, it was an invitation, they came uh, to find a job. To, to... Well, actually it, it, was a, it was a combination. Uh, and the reason being that really and I suspect uh, this is not just uh, with my parents, but I think a lot of the people that came from Greece in the 1950s um, to the United States were really leaving a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, both of my parents were very, very deeply affected by the Second World War, as I'm sure that whole uh, generation of Europeans were, but particularly in Greeks, because it was soon after the Second World War that effectively the uh, Greek Civil War occurred. And in many ways, from what I've understood, 
uh, it was a, a, a really, really bad and difficult uh, period for the country, for everybody involved on all sides. And so I think when the opportunity arose, uh, my parents seized the opportunity to leave. Greece was still in a, a process of reconstruction after both of those wars. Um, and as a result, uh, there, were, there were not a lot of prospects at the time. My father, I mentioned before, was born in Romania. And he's one of the few people I've met in my life who lived under both uh, fascism and communism. And as, uh, as you would guess, he told me that between fascism, communism, and democracy, democracy is clearly the best option. So he was um, uh, lucky to get out of Romania when he did. And the reason he got he out a, of, yeah. He was a doctor in, in Romania, he, he was. Yeah, he was born, and this is a very interesting, there are a lot of very interesting little parenthetical anecdotes to my family history, but my father was born in Romania. My grandfather, who had been born in Gallipoli, for whatever reason, when my father was born in 1925, chose to list him as a Greek citizen. I guess that option existed at the time. Maybe he did it for patriotic reasons. Maybe he did it for more practical reasons. But the fact of the matter was that during the whole time my father was growing up, he was never a Romanian citizen. He was a citizen of Greece living in Romania, even though he had been born there. And in 1949, 1950, when Europe, uh, after the war, was being partitioned between the East and the West, and Romania went to the uh, Eastern Bloc, uh, the, the dynamic, the social dynamic in that country, from what I understand, from what my father tells me, drastically changed very, very quickly. Uh, it was an environment that he couldn't uh, live in. Uh, and so uh, the reason he was able to leave was because of my grandfather's uh, patriotic gesture, you know, whatever, 30 or 40 years uh, before. And so as a political refugee, he left Romania. And the only place uh, that was the option for him was to go to Greece. And you can imagine uh, him leaving with my grandmother, with an uncle in tow, the fact that the, um, the country had, was then under a uh, communist uh, rule. They didn't really allow them to leave with anything. He left with basically a suitcase and a few, a few personal belongings. And they arrived in Greece in 1950, basically penniless, homeless, um, and with no, uh, no prospect other than a few relatives that they knew in Athens, and as my father likes to say, with his education. Because he had uh, a medical degree, because he had uh, studied as a doctor, he said the only thing he was really armed with that had any value was his education. And in fact, that proved to be his salvation moving forward, because from there he eventually was able to come to the United States. He was sponsored here uh, by the World Council of Churches, I believe at the time. He had, um, he had applied in Athens to, to come to the United States. And between the time he applied and the time he got his approval to come, he met my mother and they got married. So there was, there was a little bit of time uh, between that, uh, those two events. Uh, from when uh, when he came to the U.S. And uh, he got the practice in New, in New Jersey? Yes, my father uh, came uh, to New York first, as, as many of uh, the Greek uh, immigrant flow uh, came. Uh, they lived in Astoria, which, as we know, is, has been a touch point for, you know, for Greeks for decades, if, if not a century at least. So he began his life in the United States in Queens, in uh, Long Island, uh, started to work at clinics in Manhattan. Uh, and at that time, while he had the medical credentials from Romania, because that's where he had gone to medical school, uh, he still had to go through a process of, of approval and recognition here before he could really start working uh, in earnest. And I believe he started his medical practice uh, in the 1960s. I was born in the early 60s, and I remember as a child going to his offices. My father was a, a vascular and general surgeon, 
He's uh, at, at the time of this interview, he's still alive. He's uh, 96 years old, obviously retired, but still very, uh, very engaged. And um, he, he likes to recount, you know, that that period of his life quite a bit. Very, very so, I know, so I know the story well. Mm -hmm. And um, both your mother uh, and father were speaking Greek uh, while you were uh, growing up uh, in the household. Absolutely. Uh, given the fact that they were um, really, I was the first generation American. I was the first person in my family born in the United States. When they came here, it was the default setting. It was just a given that it was a Greek house. It, it, it really, it was very interesting for me growing up because um, they didn't even bother speaking to me in English at home. They figured I would learn English from TV. I would learn English from uh, my friends, from school. And so I would go to school and I would uh, socialize with friends, little kids that lived in the neighborhood. But when I would come back into my house, everything from the smells to the, the temperature of the house, which was always warm, uh, the, the, the crackling of the radio in the background that was playing Greek music and getting, it really felt like I was transported into, um, into another environment. So they, they held Greece and the idea, uh, the Hellenic idea, very, very, very close. I mean, it was uh, the food, the atmosphere, the language, everything, um, you could have stepped in and you thought you might have been in a house in Athens. That's really uh, what the environment was like. And obviously, uh, a big part of that, and I think a big part of the Greek experience in the United States has been the role of the church uh, in that experience. Uh, they've been a, a, a bearer of the torch of Hellenism, you know, I think for expatriate uh, Greeks all over the world, really. So my parents absolutely uh, plugged into that. Uh, infrastructure as well. I see. So uh, as a child, you had friends who had a Greek background and also non-Greek background. So Correct. how was the reaction of the, of the non-Greeks uh, coming across with the Greek culture, coming visiting your, 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 your home? And, uh, well, it, it, it was interesting. <laughs> they knew that you were Greek, although you were an American. Uh, for... Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it varied. It varied, and this is what makes uh, growing up uh, in America so interesting, or what used to make it so interesting, because we lived on a block uh, in New Jersey where it was primarily doctors, like my father, and almost by coincidence, the other three or four families that were doctors that lived on this block were Italians. So on the one hand, you know, uh, being Greek is a little bit different, a little bit more exotic. And all of their children, of course, were growing up within, within an American context. But, you know, nevertheless, Italians are still uh, Mediterranean. And so there were commonalities that we discovered fairly quickly between the Italians and us and everybody else. Uh, whereas, you know, when I would go to the houses of other kids whose background might be more Northern European or other ethnicities, then it was completely different. I mean, they... They looked at me like I had uh, three eyes <laughs> in my head. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things I like to joke about uh, today, uh, a lot of my friends uh, refer to me as Yanni, you know, my Greek name. But my parents in the 1960s when I was born listed me as John. I don't think that would be the case today. You know, if, uh, if I was born today, they would have no reservation at all about giving me a name that was identical in Greek as it was in English. But you see, at that time, in the 1950s, uh, there was this desire to acclimate and to become part of the new culture without losing uh, the old culture. So it, it was an interesting, um, interesting time to grow up, for sure. Very interesting, yes. Uh, how about um, at that period, uh, with your parents and you as, as a child, you are visiting Greece at that time. Yes. As, as a matter of fact, uh, the very first visit I had uh, to Greece, uh, I barely remember because it, it I must have been three or four years old. And it was really the first time that my mother had gone back 
since she left in 56. So she, they had lived here about 10 years in the United States before they took their first trip back. But I remember uh, very vividly the, the trips that followed in the late 60s and early 70s, because as my father established his medical practice and as they stabilized financially, they were able to start going back uh, more frequently. And some of my most beautiful and vivid memories of, of my whole life were going back to the Athens uh, of my grandparents and going into the house that my mother was born in and which my grandparents still lived in in the late 60s and early 70s and, and having an, an immersion in a completely different uh, what I'd like to think of as a very visceral uh, experience of Athens at that time. And we went back quite frequently in, in those years. It became almost an annual uh, trek, uh, which I think a lot, of, um, a lot of Greek immigrants went into that pattern where they would uh, spend the year here, they would work, they would go to school, and then the, the, the kids and and uh, the wife would, would go to Greece while Baba was working, and then he would join them, you know, for a few weeks uh, uh, towards the end of the summer. We were, we were exactly in that same pattern. Uh, you were young at the time, but I imagine, or I, I make a hypothesis that it was uh, difficult for your parents going back uh, to Greece in the 70s because we already had uh, another junta. So people who went through fascism through uh, the strong arm of, of uh, the, the Romanian uh, Communist Party, the wars, the civil war, and, and then going back to Greece during the junta, it wouldn't be easy for them. I don't know if you have any yeah. memories. Well, actually, actually, you make a very good point because the one thing, regardless of, of your political affiliations, you know, when, when they were going back into an environment like that, they realized that the United States for all of its, uh, its own issues and, and uh, problems was at the time very, very politically and economically stable. And that's something that I think they valued. And when they would go back to Greece and they would see that this government was overthrown or now there was a military dictatorship in place, it reminded them of what they had left of this kind of political instability and unassuredness. And so I think they, if anything, that while they loved going back to Greece and they loved seeing our relatives and their parents, they also felt that they had made the best decision by leaving because they, they, you cannot thrive in a society that is constantly under political upheaval. It's just impossible. And I think my parents uh, realized that. And if anything, those trips from, you know, the Hunda was what, 67 to 74, uh, they had a very visible presence in, in Greece at the time. Even as a child, I remember. I still remember the big signs of the, of the phoenix and all, all of these uh, symbols and, um, you know, uh, propagandist uh, kind of symbology that even a, even a little kid that didn't understand any of that realized uh, there's, something, there's something here that is very, very visible and in your face. Whereas in the United States, it seemed more of the, the background noise, you know. And then uh, you finish uh, high school, then, then uh, when you made the decision to become uh, an architect and the family was supportive or controversial, how was it? <laughs> I see, I see you, know, I know, you know the psychology of Greek families quite well. Um, I, what I like to say to people who ask me uh, about architecture and the role it's played in my life is that really, I think I decided to be an architect when, when I first saw the Parthenon uh, taking a walk with my grandmother when I was four or five. It, I didn't know what I was looking at, but it had such a visceral and subliminal impact on me that the image uh, stayed with me uh, through, throughout my life. I. Uh, was always artistically inclined. I remember being able to draw with a pencil and paper probably before I could speak. In many ways, it was, uh, it was a mode of communication for me that I found 
really uh, uh, enriching and also a world that I could uh, escape into, a world that I could create by drawing. And as I grew up and as I went to high school, my father uh, was a practicing physician. He actually became quite successful over the course of his career. And it was almost expected that I would follow in his footsteps, uh, not, not because they wanted to dissuade me from anything else, but in their mind, thinking very practically, they realized the struggle that they had gone through and they figured, well, we've already set up uh, the, the infrastructure, it's in place, you know, it would be so easy for you just to follow in your father's footsteps and, and continue. But as we know, you know, uh, sometimes those types of plans don't work. I, I could have been an artist. I could have been a musician. At times in my life, I've played those roles. Architecture was a, a bit of a compromise, uh, but it was also, it, it seemed like the logical uh, place for me to wind up. And so I, um, I went to school uh, at Temple University in Philadelphia, where I got my uh, Bachelor of Architecture degree uh, in the 80s. And then I went on to get a master's in urban design from Columbia in the, uh, in the early 90s. See. Let's talk about uh, this whole chain of command or, 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 or grouping, because uh, I've seen the, the census data and I realized that many uh, Greeks and Greek Americans are, uh, whatever it is related to, to construction in New York in particular, architects, mm -hmm. civil engineering, uh, contractors, construction workers, and it's a large number. The percentage uh, within the Greek community, it, it's very less than the average uh, uh, American. And, and, and I see that, uh, it, on the other hand, you see an almost or maybe an accurate uh, stereotype about Greeks focusing on the food industry, diners and restaurants. But right. it's not exactly true, right? Because a lot of Greeks are uh, in, the, in, in whatever is related to, to construction, to architecture. And, 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 and what is your, your take on that? And uh, why we're not well known for, for this? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it, it's an interesting phenomenon that you cite, and I don't think it's just New York, because I know people in Chicago, I know people in other cities in the U.S., and I suspect if you go to Australia uh, or other uh, large Greek communities, you probably see the same phenomenon. I think it comes from a couple of different directions, and, and I think the first direction that it comes from, you mentioned the food industry, which is interesting because I think that Greeks that came to the United States that unlike my father, maybe they didn't have, they weren't armed with the education, but they definitely were motivated to create a better life. They got into an industry like the food business, which um, was very, very clear in terms of how the business worked. Obviously it was very hard work, uh, very unforgiving work, but it started to, to deal with the situation where you started uh, to roll in terms of business and cash. And I think a natural migration was to start investing in real estate. You know, in other words, you, you open a restaurant or a diner, you start making money. Maybe uh, you don't want to rent that diner anymore. Maybe you want to buy it. Maybe you want to buy the apartments that are above it. And so I think part of that phenomenon had to deal with the the cut and dry business aspect of investment and, and increasing one's footprint. And I think from there, as, as in any uh, group, you're gonna get um, a, a percentage that are incredibly successful, that generate uh, quite a bit of money, and then they're able to really uh, expand in earnest into another industry where they actually become real estate developers and they start developing uh, properties as a result of their primary business. I think that's one aspect. The other aspect, I believe, is the fact that uh, the first generation uh, of Greeks, I can't speak about the 19th century, you know more about that than I do, but in terms of my personal family experience in the 20th century, including my wife's father, 
who came here from Greece, was educated here. He went to NYU. And in those days, it was doctor, lawyer, engineer. I mean, those were kind of the three, you know, safe uh, roads as, as it w- was known to them. Uh, he became an engineer. And uh, I, through him, I met a number of Greek engineers, structural, mechanical, electrical, who also played a role in, um, in the aspect of the building industries. And of course, you have these different disparate groups that begin to find each other because ultimately, you know that it, wherever you are in the world, when one Greek meets another, even randomly, Within an hour or two, they're talking about opening some kind of a business together. It's just, it's just the nature of our, of our psyche to do that. And so um, I, think, I think the most odd aspect of it is the architecture component, because you don't see that many Greeks involved architecturally, uh, as you see with the engineers and the real estate developers. There have been a few. Uh, I worked for one who became uh, quite famous over the course of his career, Costas Kondilis in New York. He was arguably probably the most famous Greek architect in the United States, I would say, just given, um, given the impact he had on the skyline of New York City. But I think he was an outlier. I don't, I don't think you see that much uh, in architecture the way you see in the other aspects of the building industry. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm just theorizing yes, ab- a little bit absolutely yes uh, and that, that's why i met in new york city in particular uh, because of condilis and other people yeah who, as, as you said they they changed uh, the face or, or the look of, of, of the skyline of new york's skyline yeah. and this is a very interesting uh, research project by by itself i hope oh absolutely point, yeah yeah we can do that but it's not only the designing uh, as you said, is also uh, the, the the builders, the, the developers, people who actually you know uh, raise those uh, 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 high uh, uh, skyscrapers. Sure. Right? There, there are a lot of Greeks doing that, uh, that job, and also absolutely uh, construction workers, right? Yeah, I think in all in all aspects and in all levels of the building industry, you see people that are you know at executive levels on the banking and the finance side. You see people that are in the practical, hardcore construction end, whether they're providing the construction materials or whether they're providing the contracting services to build. You have some that are designing these buildings, a lot of that are providing engineering services. So for sure, over the course of the years that I worked in New York as an architect, it was almost shocking how many Greeks I wound up a meeting from all different cross section of the whole industry. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, they, they have penetrated that industry and they have definitely made it their own. Uh, the roots, you know, as we discussed uh, are, are interesting because I think there are different, different roots that led them to where they are. Uh, according to what you know, because you have, you know, very wide knowledge and deep knowledge about all of this and I would like to, to, to discuss a few things now. If sure. uh, uh, the Greek architects or builders, they brought something particular uh, Greek into their designs or, or, or creation or, and also uh, if New York uh, or other cities that you might know uh, have uh, the Greek element, the, the general Hellenic uh, uh, design. Is, is the States uh, a country, a place where ancient Greece is somewhere there embedded like it is in Europe, for example, uh, during the um, Hellenic uh, eras? Well, yeah, I mean, we, I, I was involved in a whole panel, uh, I'm sure you remember on this very phenomenon uh, of the idea of uh, America as a as a political uh, idea, uh, as as with any political idea, you know, architecture is is a very interesting um, field uh, and an area of study because architecture tends to lend credence to many different political ideas, and I think when the country 
uh, was being founded. And it was really the result of the, you know, political philosophies that were emerging in Europe, as you know, in the 18th and 17th centuries, even earlier, uh, that uh, to a large degree were based on precedents from antiquity, uh, in some cases more Roman than Greek, but nevertheless, you know, somebody like Jefferson or, uh, looked to ancient Greece as this very idealized a view of, um, of organized political society, uh, it was no coincidence that the, uh, the buildings that came to be built to represent this new republic uh, on this side of the Atlantic were dressed in those architectural precedents, those forms. Um, and so I think on the one hand, you've had a, a very, very deep impact uh, and that was coincident, which is very interesting. The, it coincided with the rediscovery of buildings from antiquity, because at the same time that you had these political ideologies developing, you know, with the advent of the French Revolution and, and even earlier uh, movements, you also had a rediscovery of antiquity that was rooted even earlier in the Renaissance at the end of the medieval period. And so you had these Europeans going down to Italy and Greece and digging you know, with their shovels and picks and, and walking through these ancient sites and beginning to reconstruct the remnants of the ancient world while simultaneously they were reading old political philosophies and looking at an enlightenment Europe and as a result, I feel that all of that was somehow um, uh, uh, collated into a vision of, uh, of the American Republic. So I don't think any of the Greek um, state capital buildings or, or court buildings or any civic building that you see anywhere in America, it's not coincidental that, it, that it's a Doric or Ionic order or it has a recall of uh, the Temple of Hephaestus in Athens or any of this stuff, it, it, it's all interconnected. It's all part of what was happening at that time that America was being founded. I know that's a very long-winded answer, but that's the best one that I can give you. No, no, no it is very interesting because uh, I would like your critique and opinion. But you see, you said in the States, the discovery or the rediscovery of... Uh, uh, the Greek line of, of, the, of the Greek element in architecture right. and other things. At the same time, uh, you, as a scientist, as a creator, as an artist, you visit Greece and you see Athens, where we don't have the discovery or rediscovery, but the disappearance, I think, of Greek architecture. Uh, is this true or how, how do you explain that? Uh, I think uh, it, it's a paradox. And I think it is true, but I think uh, the, the primary, the predominant reason is because, if, I, I'll give you the perfect example. If you, if you go to Italy and you look at um, you know, major cities in Italy, or even if you look at villages, the first thing you're gonna see is a, a sense of continuity uh, really from the, the Middle Ages all the way through today. The problem uh, with Greece, uh, I think one of, one of the problems was that, you know, it was occupied by the Ottomans for 400 years, where effectively uh, any traces of antiquity uh, were either uh, ignored or misunderstood or just buried for whatever reasons maybe reasons of, uh, of extinguishing national identity. I mean, that's a whole other discussion that we can get into. But I think as a result, you had uh, generations of people born in Greece that really had no idea of their cultural legacy as opposed to European scholars that had a much better idea of, of Greek history than, than actually Greeks living there, let's say on that land in the 19th century. That was almost completely attributed to the fact of Ottoman occupation. Um, I think how, and, and the perfect example is that when Greece became a unified country after the revolution, by the middle of the 19th century, I think one of the greatest ironies that, that I've 
seen reading this history is that when you look at the, the, the Vuli, the parliament building, when you look at the Zapion, when you look at all of these neoclassical buildings in Athens, the, the library, the university, those were designed by European architects that Greece had to import because the knowledge didn't exist in Greece. The, the place that, that, that birthed this architectural language no longer could speak the language. They could no longer read the language. They needed to, to import scholars to, um, to make it happen. And I think, unfortunately, even though we're now you know, 200 years down the road, um, there were so many other economic and social pressures that occurred in the interim. Um, again, dealing with you know, the remnants of the Ottoman Empire and uh, the Balkans and, and all types of things that occurred uh, at the beginning of the 20th century that, that Greece never really had the opportunity to properly ground itself the way uh, a country like Italy sees this, this cultural continuity. I mean, I, that, that's my opinion. Uh, that's, that's the way I see it. And that's why Athens is such a, such a mishmash. Uh, and, and it's quite jarring, you know, when you go there. I was also in Thessaloniki this summer, and that's a whole other phenomenon, you know, that, that you could talk about for hours. But again, it has some of the same, some of the same issues uh, that I'm touching on. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, in your uh, uh, line of, uh, of work and, and, uh, and creativity, uh, being uh, understood by other people that you are Greek, that was a, an advantage, a disadvantage, a neutral, it mattered that you had a Greek background in, in, in your occupation. Uh, in my occupation as an architect, uh, it didn't really matter. Uh, I, I, here uh, in the U.S., uh, it actually began to uh, had a much bigger impact when I was doing a lot of work overseas, believe it or not. There was a period of time uh, I ran my own firm. I had, a, I had an architecture firm that I opened in 2009. It went until 2017. And over the course of that time, almost a decade, I wound up through a, a lot of different uh, circumstances, doing a lot of work in Eastern Europe, actually bringing the conversation back to the beginning. Uh, the Black Sea region, the region that my father was originally from, my grandparents, and going there, uh, I was identified as a Greek American architect and the Greek was emphasized because I think in many ways, that created a, a common bond with, with those cultures that was actually surprising for me. Part of it was, you know, the, the orthodox, the arc of orthodox religion in that region of the world. Part of it was an even, even older legacy of, uh, of Black Sea settlements that, that uh, Greek colonies had, uh, had settled in antiquity. Um, so it was, it was very interesting to see that sub suddenly something that I didn't really emphasize as an architect here in the United States was being emphasized uh, as an architect working in that part of the world. That's quite, quite striking. But how do you identify yourself? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I think... Um, I, I have to say it, it's a little bit of a neurosis for me because I've never really fully felt American uh, given the fact that I spent a lot of time in Greece when I was a kid and, and given the fact that our household growing up was so uh, ethnically Greek. Um, and on the other hand, going to Greece, I, I was always viewed as an American. So it, it, it's been a bit of a, a bit of a confusing identity. I'm I'm both and I'm neither. That's kind of how uh, that's how I look at myself. So what do I do? I I wind up relying on on Socrates and telling people I'm a citizen of the world, not just of Athens. <laughs> so um, throughout the years, you had. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less involvement with the Greek-American community. Any associations, any yeah. 
association with any professional association of Greeks? How, how was your relationship with the Greek community? Um, my relationship was really driven by uh, where I happened to be working and what I was working on. Um, there was a time before I opened my own firm, I worked for Costas Gondilis, the architect we mentioned earlier. I was actually the director of design at his firm in uh, the early 2000s, the mid 2000s. And because he was very high profile, uh, there were a lot of high profile Greeks that were communicating with him. And just through default, you know, I wound up interfacing with them. And the projects were more high profile. You know, they were, there were certain cultural weight. As an example, uh, almost, it's been almost uh, 20 years now, but, but the very early, early versions of the Hellenicon master plan outside of Athens, when they were only beginning to conceptually talk about it, at some point there was a group that came from Athens to New York and they came to Kondilis' office and we actually sat and talked about some general planning principles about what would happen to that, uh, to that piece of land uh, near Glyfada. Um, so it, it was really a circumstance of uh, working with his office uh, and dealing with um, uh, people uh, in that orbit of New York, of the New York City uh, Greek American community at that time. And uh, there is a, a church nearby uh, in your in your community that uh, or university that you have uh, some interactions with the Greeks there. I uh, well, we, when we I was. It is a large number of Greeks who live in New Jersey, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, it, it's quite it's quite surprising. You know, I think um, when you look at the uh, the number of churches here, because that's really the one touch point where you can actually measure, uh, you know, empirically just just what's going on with the Greek community. Uh, there are, there are very large communities. The the area that I grew up in, northern New Jersey. Um, there was a church that, um, that's still there in Clifton that my parents are members of, that I went to. Um, other, other churches in the area that I've been, uh, that I've been to uh, and have been involved with in, in, in most cases, you know, to some degree professionally. Uh, I worked for a time with a firm in New Jersey that was doing some work uh, for some of the churches here. Uh, so it's been interesting to, uh, to see it from that angle as well. Uh, as far as universities go, not, not really. Uh, I have been involved with um, uh, some organizations in New York, uh, probably the, the one that was the, the most, most involved for me, and actually was founded by our mutual friend Lukatsos Emka, the East Mediterranean Business and Culture Alliance, uh, I was involved in, and actually helped Lou found that organization uh, in its early years, uh, organizing uh, speakers and events and, and activities. So um, one thing that I, that I have to say that that organization uh, showed me, which I kind of admired about our ethnicity, is that, you know, you can think of Greeks almost like a duality. On the one hand, you have this incredible... Um, you know, cultural weight from antiquity and the enlightenment of the world and all of the things that, that came out of that part of the Aegean, uh, you know, <laughs> from, from the late Bronze Age through the, uh, the, 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 the Roman period. But on the other hand, you also have this no-nonsense business uh, reputation that the Greeks have as well, that, you know, driven by commerce and how you can go anywhere in the world and you can find a Greek, you know, running a, 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 a business of some kind and completely acclimated and very comfortable in that environment. And an organization like EMCA really kind of bridged uh, those two worlds, which was very, very interesting to see, you know, to have, you know, architects and poets and bankers and businessmen, you know, gathered in the same place and really discussing issues that, uh, that affected all of them because of their uh, common ethnicity. Very, very interesting. Uh, in those events, uh, do, you, do you see 
the presence of uh, the new Greek American youth and what kind of youth that it will be in the, in the next few years in comparison to your growing up? They're going to continue a big identity, going to be a different identity. Are they well, involved? My, I, I, can, I can speak uh, from direct experience because I have a, a daughter who is uh, going to be 25 uh, this month and is, a, is just starting law school uh, in Michigan. And she was born in the United States, uh, is, is much more of an acclimated uh, American than I will ever be, purely because of her, her own uh, personal experience. So I see her uh, approach to Greece and, and her ethnicity in, in a very interesting way. I think that as opposed to having a bit of an identity crisis the way I have had, she has no identity crisis. She knows who she is, she knows where she lives and, and, and what she's doing, but she uh, places a lot of value um, uh, on her Greek identity, on that part of her identity. And I think she, like a lot of people her age who are, who are Greek Americans, see it as a very, very deep and rich uh, fountain that they can pull from. Um, they know their history, Uh, to a large degree, they know they know um, the modern and the ancient history, uh, but they also know uh, what uh, Greek uh, culture and Hellenic culture has done for the world, and so they understand uh, its contributions. And for them personally, because they have a familiarity with the language, because maybe they can they can see common touch points much easier than people that don't speak Greek. You know, I mean, if you're in the sciences, uh, most of your terminology, if you go to medical school or you're in engineering or you're studying physics or whatever, chemistry, there's going to be always roots that are, that are going all the way back to Aristotle, really, you know, the, with the, the foundation of scientific principles and even the names and even, even what things are called. So I think people that that have a Greek background have that kind of built-in advantage. And I think Greek Americans of this generation understand that. Uh, they're highly educated. Uh, so it's probably the most educated generation of uh, Greek Americans that we've seen so far. And as a result of that education, they, they just have more uh, resources and more tools that they can pull from. And I think they treat their ethnicity as one more of those tools. Very interesting, but uh, at the same time, uh, do they participate in what we call the organized community? Do they participate in uh, ethnic organizations or uh, do they participate in uh, uh, occupational uh, uh, organizations of breaking the Greekness? Uh, because uh, from uh, my research and other people's research, of course, uh, The, I realized that there is a big crisis in all the institutions created by the immigrant generation, either those are the schools, the language, the associations, even the church. And part of this is that what I argue is that uh, the immigrant generation still controls all those institutions without letting the new generation to enter massively and develop it and, and, and transform it. So well, I, if, if it collapses, then how the Greek community will continue uh, in the States after 120 years? Well, you know, that, that you make a very good point. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't consider myself uh, a churchgoer. I, I, I don't really go. Uh, I, I, I understand its value. Uh, as, uh, as holding uh, the ethnicity together. But I think that you, what happens with any ethnic group that's an expatriate group, uh, I believe, is that if you stay in a country long enough, eventually you begin to acclimate. You know, the marriages get mixed. The, the mother language uh, becomes more and more a thing of the past. Uh, and, you, and you become part of this new hybrid uh, ethnicity, which is no longer, you know, the ethnicity of your grandparents. I mean, that's, that's absolutely clear. I think um, 
while I understand the church's value in particular, the Greek Orthodox Church, I think it's also had a little bit of a stranglehold on Greek ethnicity in the United States. And I think it, to a degree, it's been detrimental. And the, the only reason I say that is because I see that younger generation Greeks are no longer relying on it as a single resource to connect with other Greeks. You know, they're, with all of the technology that, that is existent today, with this whole educated generation that can find each other, whether it's on university campuses or online or even through professional business organizations uh, where, let's say, you've got two bankers, they get together and they look at each other's names on the list and say, oh, you know, Akis, Adis, you know, we're, we're similar, we're related. They, they connect in that way. So I think it all depends what you mean by crisis. If you're saying that um, the, the type of, of ethnic um, environment no longer exists that was prevalent when I was growing up, which I described to you earlier with my grandmother listening to the radio and you know, the, the, the smells and, of the house and all of that, uh, I would agree, you know, that is gone because it, it's, it's not tenable, it's not sustainable. Um, however, I think that we have such a strong uh, and vivid uh, legacy that has very long legs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's going to be uh, forgotten or I don't even think it's in crisis as a result of these institutions being in crisis. I think it's being recast as you get uh, generations of Greek Americans that have lived in this country now for two or three generations. It's inevitable that it will be recast. It's really up to them ultimately how they want to uh, preserve that legacy. The other component to all of this, of course, is the relationship of these expatriate communities back to Greece. You know, that's, that's an issue that I'm not gonna pretend that I know a lot about it because I don't. But I do know that there is a big controversy swirling around the relationship of these expatriate communities and how they're uh, interacting with official uh, Greece in, in an official capacity, whether it's through very large organizations or whether it's through branches of the Greek government that have a specific uh, department that's dedicated to you know, the, um, the diaspora these types of issues. But I think on an individual basis, where you have young, professional, educated Greeks living in the United States, maybe they don't speak the language fluently the way their parents did or their grandparents did, but the, I, I believe that the idea of being Greek is still very, very close to them and very much a part of their persona. At least that's been my experience. Very, very interesting. Uh, while you're growing up, going to college, you had any uh, knowledge or you, you receive any scholarship, any scholarships or assistance by any Greek American organization? No, no, I, I did not. I, it, it wasn't, uh, first of all, there, there was no need, luckily, <laughs> um, but it's but not. Maybe, uh, maybe for other Greeks. Did you know that some uh, scholarships existed or some? I, I, I was aware I, I was aware of them, but I was also a little bit wary of how they tied into other things. You know, I um, I've never been the type of person to like being part of a group. Uh, maybe maybe that's a, been a, one of my detriments. You know, I've always liked to operate more thinking individually. And so whenever you see. Uh, a scholarship or, or some kind of benefit offered to you, there are usually strings attached and uh, it's the strings that bother me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like to maintain my independence to the degree that I can. But um, I, I am aware there are many, many scholarships. And I know that, uh, I mean, my daughter participated in a scholarship program like that, as well as her cousins and a lot of other uh, Greek American kids that she knows for sure. Very interesting. Yeah. Now let, let's talk about uh, uh, the race issue. Since uh, you know, 
it's a big debate uh, all the time, particularly now with the Black sure. Alive movement. Growing up, you you are aware of uh, of uh, uh, um, of racism against Blacks or other uh, ethnic or racial groups or even Greeks. And 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 do you see any changes? Is any any progress into into that? Uh, into that I I can say that. I, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie and say that oh yes I was very aware of, of racism growing up uh, but what I did uh, see growing up which I see less of today is the uh, kind of the silos that all of these different ethnic groups are in for example when I went to school here in New Jersey it there was very it was very clear that there was kind of an established status quo that was predominantly a, um, a, a WASP type of, uh, uh, let's say, legacy, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of the country. And then there was everybody else, you know, the people that lived in my block, you know, the Italians, the, the Jews, the Greeks, everybody else. And when we went to school, it was very clear that there was a, there was a bit of a gulf between, you know, those people that were kind of the established status quos and everybody else. And it was not so much to do with money because even then, you know, there was financial success in all of those groups. It was more about uh, being accepted into certain aspects of um, established society in the United States. Uh, I saw it to a degree with my father, uh, all of his associations in his early days in the United States, they were with other doctors, but they were Italians and Greeks. You know, it was rare for him to, to be affiliated with, um, with, with uh, uh, other doctors of other ethnic groups. I don't see that kind of siloed ethnicity today the way I did when I was a kid. Maybe it was because when you first come to the country, your natural inclination is going to be to gravitate towards people that you know, who speak your language, who have your same religion, you like the same food, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but today, uh, that seems to have dissipated. As far as, as far as the race issue with African-Americans goes, I, I don't feel that I'm in any position to, to comment on that in any way. I know it's a big issue. I know it's a big problem. I could speak at length about you know, why I think it's a problem. I, I think that the whole history of America it has this giant, ugly, shadow on it, you know, in terms of how the country was built. Uh, I don't know that this was the right context for that conversation, but I certainly understand uh, the issue and why it exists. And it's between you and I, I don't think it's going to get solved anytime soon. I don't think it can be solved. It's endemic, you know, what we're, what we're dealing with. Uh, in, in, in concluding this very interesting uh, uh, interview, uh, what are some of uh, the, the Greek values that you, you really like and you want to see them uh, transmitted to the next generation? There, there are two or three, let's say, good values, particularly Greek or more universal, let's say, that they should, they, they should uh, continue exist in, in the next generation of uh, American born Greeks? My, well, my, um, most of what I take out of our ethnicity, uh, I take from antiquity. Uh, it's just my, my natural inclination to go there, to, to study that history. And if there's one single value that I think it can all be distilled down to, it's a striving for excellence. I think that's really, you know, uh, the, the idea of areti, going back to antiquity, to um, combined with the famous quote that the unexamined life is not worth living. I think that um, when one uh, moves through life, one cannot be afraid uh, to try, to strive. Also, one cannot be afraid to fail uh, because it's usually through failure where you're going to learn the most, not, not through success. 
and I believe that, um, you know, you can find all of those concepts. You don't even have to go into Plato or, uh, or the other philosophers. All you need to do is find what was written uh, on the temple of Apollo at Delphi. All the Delphic maxims uh, really are, are summaries of, of that type of approach to living. You know, it's a, it's a type of living where you're, in, you're engaging with the world, you're understanding who you are, and you're trying to understand your place in that world, and you're trying to strive to be the best that, that you can possibly be. Otherwise, there's no point, really, you know. So that's, that's a value that I feel is very, very Greek and, and something that, that, without even realizing it, I've adopted it as basically my, my mantra for living. I mean, everything I do is with that, um, with that goal in mind, to do it as best as I possibly can. I think this is one of the best uh, ways to conclude this very interesting interview with John Yanni Futiadi. This is a Nicholas uh, Alexiou Hellenic American project. Yanni, thank you very much. Uh, thank, yeah. thank you for this opportunity. Really, I'm very honored that you would consider me and my story worthy of uh, inclusion in your project. I, I very much appreciate it. Absolutely.